Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, If you have your Bible, turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. That's where we're going to be at today, Ecclesiastes chapter 5. And then if there's any preteens left in the room, you guys can head off to your class just to go through the double doors over there, and uh, your teachers will be there to greet you. All right, Ecclesiastes chapter 5. We've been slowly making our way through this book over the past few weeks, and this will take us all the way up until uh, the end of June. All right, so I want to ask you this question. Have you ever noticed that some things in life just move incredibly fast? Uh, So maybe it's uh, vacations. Those seem to always go by way, way too fast. Uh, Kids growing up, that goes by so incredibly fast. Just the other day, uh, I was there with my family. Natalie, she's she's almost three now, and it just amazes me uh, how fast she has grown up. Now, when she was really young, it was like, man, every day is so hard. But, But now, you know, things just change so quickly over time. You realize that some of the most exciting moments in life just seem to just come and go in a flash, where you wish that moment could just last forever. Maybe it was like your wedding day where, you know, you planned everything for the ceremony, ceremony then all of a sudden it's just done, it's, it's over with. And these things that we just look forward to and we anticipate just are gone so quickly. But the reality is that most of our lives are spent in the ordinary, slow pace of life. You, you go to work, you go to school, uh, you, uh, you spend time with friends, with family, uh, you go to church, and like, th- this is just the everyday normal rhythm of life, and, and each day is relatively the same as the next and it is through these, this ordinary pace of life that things slowly develop in our lives. When we think about being followers of Christ, sometimes we can think of these big dramatic moments Or maybe in your life, maybe you've been a follower of Christ for a long time, and you can look back to this moment where you went off to camp, and you just have this amazing experience at camp that one time that really set your your life on a trajectory. Or or maybe you've just been a follower of Christ for a a relatively short amount of time, and you just look forward to those those highs of being there for Easter or at a conference or these, these different moments, but the reality is that most of our life is just spent in this slow, everyday, ordinary time. And so what we recognize is that good habits take time to form. And it takes time for these to develop and work in our lives to see positive results. And, and on the same hand, often it is bad decisions and, and worldly perspectives that, that slowly take hold in our lives. They just subtly creep their ways into our lives and into our thinking. It's often not through a big dramatic event, and we just notice weeks, months, or years later how we've changed. And maybe what's happened is that you have slowly worked your way closer to God, or maybe you find yourself that you have slowly drifted further away from him. And this is what our passage tackles today, how some things slowly become part of our lives, and yet they impact us in a really profound way. And so what Ecclesiastes chapter 5 specifically focuses on is how the love of money and really how, the, how idolatry can impact our lives how this slowly can take form in our lives where we can place something over our affection and our love for God. And so this is what we're going to tackle today. And I want to look at a couple key passages uh, in Ecclesiastes. So I'm going to start off in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, starting off in verse 10. I'm going to read the first two verses here. It says, The one who loves silver is never satisfied with silver, and whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with income. This too is futile. 
When good things increase, the ones who consume them multiply. What then is the profit to the owner except to gaze at them with his eyes? And then jumping down to chapter 6 and verse 1, he continues his thought. He, he ends it with this. He says, There is a tragedy I have observed under the sun, and it weighs heavily on humanity. God gives a person riches, wealth, and honor so that he lacks nothing of all he desires for himself. But God does not allow him to enjoy them. Instead, a stranger will enjoy them. This is futile and a sickening tragedy. This is what we need to understand from this passage here today. Understand this, that idolatry creeps into our lives subtly, but over time, it robs us of joy. This is what we need to see, that it slowly creeps into our lives. Idolatry is, is what happens when we turn something into an ultimate thing in our lives. And, alt- and, and often what we do is we, we idolize things that are, that are actually good things, but they were never meant to be ultimate things in our lives. So this passage zeroes in specifically, quite often it focuses on the idea of wealth. And, and so we need to understand that, you know, money, wealth, that isn't a bad thing, but we need to understand that it, it's actually a terrible God to serve. You know, children are, are a good thing, but, but they are also terrible, terrible gods as well. Marriage is a good thing, but, but that shouldn't be the ultimate thing in your life. There's so many things that we can think of that we tend to make ultimate things that we focus all of our attention upon And if we truly get at it, we realize that we have made this into the biggest thing in our lives. And ultimately, as this passage shows, that they always let us down. It always ends up robbing us of joy in the end. And so there's this uh, level of soul satisfaction that these things cannot provide. The more that we try to satisfy our souls in these things, the more our joy is actually going to be robbed. Uh, I wonder if you've ever had this experience. Um, so maybe you've had this experience where, where you go out to the store and you want to buy the, the, the latest iPhone, or, or maybe you've been saving up and you finally get that, that brand new car that you've been wanting, like whatever it is, that thing that you've been wanting for, for a long time, and so you, you save up and you go out and you finally get it. I wonder if any of you have experienced this, where you, you, you finally get it, and you do two things. They say, one, do you want the, the protection plan? You're like, nope, I'm not paying for that. But then you take it, and you're like, you won't let anyone touch it. You won't let anyone see it. You're like, can, I, you know, can someone borrow your car? You're like, no, not a chance. This has been the thing I've been wanting for so long. And, and you hold on to it, and you keep it, and you're like, you, you, you want to make sure that it, it's in perfect, pristine condition. And that lasts maybe for a few days, a few weeks, but, but slowly over time, that thing that you've held in high honor in your life actually becomes more and more ordinary over time. So that dream car that you've been saving up 10 years later, now you have a teenage son or daughter and they ask to borrow a vehicle, you're like, sure, take the older one. You can take that one, right? Because, you know, it's kind of worn off. It's not, not nearly as special as it used to be. And then what happens? Then we start thinking about what's that next thing? That next thing that I'm going to save up for, that next thing I'm going to get that's going to bring joy into my life. And again, the cycle continues over and over again. Now here's the thing. We rarely encounter anyone who would say, you know, I I have an idolatry problem. Like, rarely. If, if someone tells me that, I know that they have probably attended freedom session. I know that they have probably, you know, been discipled to some point where they can explain in their minds. But most people, 99% of the conversations I have, that is not the wording that we use. We tend not to think that we are falling into that trap. We, we tend to think of ourselves as, you know, we have this under control, 
yeah, you know, I, I love God, and yeah, I love technology, or I love buying, you know, new things, whatever it is, and, and, you know, those things don't really have a hold on my life. God, of course, is the most important thing, and then if you dig a little bit deeper into it, you realize, well, where do you spend most of your money? Well, on, on these things. Where do you spend most of your time and, and, and thought life? It, it, it's kind of on these other things. How much time do you spend to God? It's like, well, I haven't thought a whole lot about that. And we think through, like, where are our priorities are? Are we actually holding him as the ultimate thing in our lives? Or have we slowly allowed the sin of idolatry to slowly creep into our lives? And so today, as we study this passage, I want to point to five signs that you are developing an idolatry problem. That's what I want to look at. Five, what are five signs that this is becoming a problem? You know, maybe you'd say, no, I'm, you know, I, I'm not, you know, I, I don't have this as a real problem right now, but I'm just going to say, like, maybe you're heading in that direction. Maybe we'll just use that language right now. But put it this way, you know, if you, if you went to a doctor and they decide, hey, I'm going to run some blood work on you, and, and so you, you go over to Life Labs, you do the blood work, and, uh, and they come back and they say, whoa, you know, we did the blood work, and what we found is, um, hey, your, your cholesterol levels are, are getting a little high. And um, you notice your, your insulin levels, you know, that's, that's a little off too. Um, and, and each time, the doctor tells you this. Hey, your cholesterol is a little bit high. And you say, well, you know, I feel fine. You know, your insulin's a little off. I feel fine. You know, your, your blood pressure, you know, we tested that too. That's getting a little bit high. You're concerned about that. And you say, I feel fine. I feel fine. Like, why are you telling me all these things? Yeah, you, you did all this blood work, but, you know, I'm, I'm fine. I'm just going to go on and carry on with my life. <laughs> now, if we hear someone say that, we know that that's probably not the right attitude to take. If someone that you know, that you really care about, told you, hey, I went to the doctor, and they told me all these things that are wrong with me, and, you know, I, I, all these things that I need to take care of, but, you know, I feel fine, you would say, hey, what's, what's going on? You should take that more seriously. You're going to change the way that you're living because I want you to, to be with me for, for a long, long time. And so sometimes we don't take action. Though we feel fine, this leads to, we know, major problems in our lives. In Ecclesiastes, we see these different warning signs of our heart, of what, what actually our affections are focused on. And so just as with our physical health, we need to take our spiritual health incredibly seriously today. So let's look at these different signs. The first sign is that you begin to lack compassion. This section in Ecclesiastes actually starts off by addressing the issue of oppression in verses 8 and 9. Uh, in verses 8, it says, uh, If you see oppression of the poor and, and perversion of justice and righteousness in the province, don't be astonished at the situation because one official protects another official, and higher officials protect them. So he points to this idea that, you know, um, you know th th there's going to be oppression of the poor, and those who should stop it are actually looking out for themselves. And, and the question we have to ask is, why? Why is this happening? They're in these positions, you know, why are these officials perverting justice? And the reason is because their hearts have grown cold. Rather than caring for others around them, rather than caring for the people that they should really truly be looking out for, they begin to care more for themselves. And what this is actually saying is that by making themselves an idol, putting themselves as the top priority in their lives, they begin to lack compassion for the people around them. And what we see in scripture is that as followers of Jesus, we are called to have real compassion for those around us. Uh, Micah 6.8, a, a well-known passage, it says that we are to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly 
This is what we're called to as followers of God, is that this is really meant to change the way that we live our lives, that to have compassion. You know, to say that we have compassion is easy to say, but really what it says, it requires a, a lowering of ourselves. If we're going to have real, true compassion for those around us, it means that we can't hold ourselves up high, but instead we, we lower ourselves down. It requires us to actually take action in our lives. I, I love reading stories of people who have gone around the world of missionaries that have gone to go and, and serve in some of the most desperate situations. Uh, years ago, I had a conversation with someone who works for Compassion Canada, and, and he takes people on trips all around the world, and, and he was taking some people on trips uh, to some refugee camps. And, and as they, they landed and they, they get to the area where they're going to go and, and visit the camp, and he stops with the, the group that he's taking with them of different missionaries and pastors, and he says, hey, like, you're going you're gonna to walk into this a, a, a horrendous situation right now. I want you to prepare yourselves. You've seen the photos, you've, you've heard the stories, but what you aren't ready for is that the first people that are going to greet you are, are, are not the adults, it's not the moms and the dads, it's going to be the children. And they're going to run up to you first, and they're going to want to wrap their arms around you, they're going to want to greet you because you're visiting their home and the reality is that the situation that they're living in, they haven't, they haven't bathed, they don't have soap, they don't have the most basic hygienic things that we have. And if you can, if you can open up your heart enough to, to be able to reach out your hand, if they reach out to shake your hand or if they want to give you a hug, would you open up your heart enough to not shrink back but actually to lean in in that situation, to show them love and compassion. It's easy to say we have compassion for the people around us, but until we actually encounter a situation where we have to lower ourselves to actually show this level of care, this is what the gospel calls us to. And so for us to work against the, the creeping slow effects of idolatry taking over our lives, taking root, we need to take time to humble ourselves and to seek ways to help those who are in need. This is why I'm so excited whenever we have opportunities to help out with our partner organizations in the area for those who are working with those who are really facing hard situations uh, such as with safe families. They just work with people who are facing difficult situations. And, and as a church, we get to go and help them. We get to be a part of that. And the thing I, I often say with safe families is it's not like it's this big organization. We help out a little bit. Like, like they work within the church. Like it's with us to be able to go to anyone who's facing just hard situations in life. Where life's just hit them hard and they went, now we can come around side of them and say, hey, how can we help you in really practical, tangible ways? The second sign that idolatry is great, taking hold in our lives is this, that you crave more and more. This is the verse that I read earlier on. It says, the one who loves silver is never satisfied with silver, and, the ones who, and whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with income. This, too, is futile. I wonder if you have ever encountered that in your life where you, you get a raise or you finally get your income tax money back and you say, yes, life is good, but if only I had just like a little bit more. You know, like, <laughs> like hey, this solves some of my problems, but if I had just a little bit more, then more of my problems would finally be solved. If you find yourself in that where it's never enough, you know, just need a little bit more wealth, just a little, few more possessions, we realize that idolatry is taking over. When we make wealth into an ultimate thing in your life, you can't, it's impossible to be, become content. And this is what God really wants for us, is to be content in our lives, to have real 
joy each day. But if we've set this as the ultimate goal in our lives, we're going to continuously be driven to make more and to accumulate more and more. Ironically, verse 11 says that if this is our posture, then, you know, all that we're actually going to attract to ourselves, this is how one commentator put it, all that we end up attracting to ourselves are, what he says, are leeches. He says, that's actually when, if this becomes the main thing in your life, you're going to end up finding that your friends or family around you are actually going to be the ones who, who actually, they're going to want that money as well. They're going to want a piece of that wealth as well. And so we have to be careful of, hey, like, what relationships are we cultivating in our lives? If you want to, put it this way, if you want to disciple your children to not have a love of money and possessions, then you need to model that in your life as well. Are, are you showing to them on a continuous basis that this thing is not the most important thing in your life? That sure, you might work hard and you might save for a nice vacation, but are you, are you showing them in other ways that that isn't the most important thing in your life? As verse 12 says, all this ends up resulting in is misery. It says, hey, like, you won't even be able to sleep at night if we continue down this path. This is what God wants to free us from. He wants to change the way in which we view the things that we have. So the third sign that we'll look at here is that you begin to lack generosity and a vision for stewardship. Verse 13 says, this is a sickening tragedy I've seen under the sun. Wealth kept by its owner to his harm. wonder if you've ever thought of that, that a lack of generosity is actually, actually does harm to us. I think that we tend to think of generosity really, in many ways, as, as an afterthought. You know, only, only after I've paid, you know, all my bills and I've put money into my savings and, you know, I've had a little bit of fun this week, you know, then, only then can I actually be generous. What we actually need to have is a different perspective, is that we need to think of generosity as a first priority. Hey, I, as I work hard and as I save, like, how can I be generous first with the things that God has given to me? When we, we need to build this as a priority in our lives. It's incredibly hard to set this as a second or third priority and still be able to be as generous as what God is actually calling us to. I really think that this is one of the challenges of living in, in North America, which is one of the most affluent areas in the entire world is this idea of have we set generosity as a top priority in our lives. That I think that this is an area that actually can prevent us from truly growing as followers of Christ as he's commanding us to this idea of generosity. And as we move in that area of generosity, what this passage explains is then, then we actually can have a vision for greater stewardship. Again, verse 14, it shows that, you know, the more that we try to hold on to our money, the more heartbreak it's actually going to cause. That it has this ability to cause heartache, to cause division. Verse 15 shows that holding on to wealth is one of the sure ways that we will go to the grave with nothing. And so we need to have a different vision for this. What we need to have is a vision of stewardship, of how can I take the good gifts that God has given to me to make a positive impact around the world. How can I take what God has given to me so that others might know who Christ is, that they would be able to discover life in him? 
That if we truly believe that Jesus is the solution for, for everything in our lives, that he has transformed us, how could we not invest into his kingdom saying, I want more people to know him. So whatever God has given me, whether it's financially or through um, gifts and abilities, whatever it is, to be able to use that the others might know who he is. That if we sit on that and we aren't stewarding it well, that that is an offense to God. And so really practically on the financial side, I mean, this is why as a church we've done this year after year of having our Christmas offering. Which if you're newer to the church, our Christmas offering is where the church collectively gives several hundred thousand dollars uh, to different organizations uh, in our community and around the world so that others might find life in Christ. And this is why this year we started the Multiply campaign, which is, which is part of our Christmas offering, but it's also including some other big things that we want to do as a church, uh, such as starting some new, uh, new churches. We, we made this announcement a few weeks ago that we're working towards starting two new sites as a church. And I want to have this perspective. Sometimes I have this this conversation with someone, they'll say, hey, that's so good that you're starting a new site. You know, you don't want your church to get too big, you know. That is not, hey, that is not the reason why we start new sites. I would fill this room. Would, like, that is not the goal. The reason why we start new sites is because we just want to go where people are. Right, right? Like, that, that's the vision. Hey, if there are people in Brand County that need to know who Jesus is, we're just going to go there. It's why Forward Kitchener got started 12 years ago because I had this vision of, well, let's just go to this part of the city that, that needed a church. Honestly, if you Google map it, there's a big community here. There's like two churches in the whole area. Like this is why we're here in this part of the city is because we want to invest. We want to make sure that others can know who Christ is. And this is what we are called to whatever God has given to us, that we would make him known in our world. All right, the fourth sign. The fourth sign that idolatry has taken hold in our lives is that you lack joy. Verse 19 says, Furthermore, everyone to whom God has given riches and wealth, has also, he has also allowed him to enjoy them and take his reward and rejoice in his labor this is a gift of God. We need to understand this, that God has given us these gifts to, to enjoy, but not to turn into ultimate things in our lives. That if we turn these things into God's, we end up lacking the joy that he's saying that he wants us to experience. You see, the result is sometimes we'll just say, oh, I don't want any of these things then. But God says, no, like, I want you to find joy in all the things that I've given to you. But, but don't make that into the most important thing in your life. Now, I'll, I'll give you one example. I'll try to explain this well. If marriage becomes an, an idol in your life, then you will do everything in your power to make your spouse happy. Because with, with their joy now is, is your joy. So your spouse you know, makes you happy. So, you know, you're going to do everything in your power to make them happy. Which in many ways, that's good. You, want, you know, you want to, you know, bring joy to, to the person that you're married. But, but suppose that one day you get careless and you forget your spouse's birthday. And they get upset. They say, how could you? And, and, and now you're upset because you've done so many good things, but then you kind of beat yourself up. Like, oh man, I've messed it up again. Yeah, they're right. Well, I'm just a terrible person. And you go away miserable. But even more than that, maybe you do everything right. Maybe, maybe you make zero mistakes. And your spouse still hasn't lived, lived up to all of your expectations. Maybe they still say an unkind word. Maybe they forget your birthday, like whatever it is. They forget your anniversary, whatever it is. And even more, how devastating is that? Because you thought, man, I thought this is the one person that is meant to complete me. 
But now I find out that they're human as well. So what we're called to is if they get this good gift of marriage, enjoy that, be with that person, but recognize that they're not meant to fulfill everything in your life. That only Christ is able to complete us at that level. And so this is, I hope you understand that this is meant to be freeing to us. That we don't put that weight on anything, let alone a person or anything else in your life, that it would be the thing that brings that type of joy to you. We're free from that now. Instead, we can look to the only one who is able to satisfy our souls to the level that our souls are craving. So last point, understand this, that you, the last sign that you're developing an idolatry problem is that you fail to see the connection between the good gifts and a good God. So you want to recognize that good gift that God has given to you, but you need to make that connection. You need to understand the connection between these two things. That's why he says in chapter 6, verse 1, he says, so here's a tragedy. You know, observe this. Under the sun, the weight weighs heavily on humanity. He's saying, like, this, this is really important to get this, that God gives us he gives a person riches, wealth, and honors, so he lacks nothing of all he desires for himself, but God does not allow him to enjoy them. So here, you know, here's the temptation. We turn these good things, and, and, you know, and, and then we just kind of turn to them, and then we run. We just say, that's the most important thing in my life, but we need to see this connection that it, because God has given us a good thing, now we actually turn and we, we worship him. And if we fail to recognize this in our lives, God says that he will actually, he'll prevent us from actually fully enjoying the good gift that he has given to us. You see that warning there. He's saying, like, if you turn that into the most important thing, then, then are you actually able to fully enjoy that gift? He wants something far better for you, that as you turn to that good gift and you enjoy it, that you actually are giving praise and honor back to God. I have a good friend who, who loves to do this. He'll, he'll, he'll take a friend out for like, a really great dinner a great dinner at one of like, the best steakhouses in, in the city, and, and they'll go out there, and they'll just have a great time. And, and he loves to do this if he finds himself in a situation like that where, where as they take the first bite of that amazing steak, he'll just say, hey, how, what, how, does, that, how does that affect your relationship with Christ? He's, he's drawn this connection between enjoying this amazing meal and is that, is that actually, are you praising God in this moment? Are you giving glory to him that he would create those flavors and textures in and, and this environment that we can enjoy this together in this moment? Or are you just simply saying, oh man, I'm so glad I can afford a meal like this. Oh, thank goodness for, you know, the, the chef who has the ability to prepare this. Or, those are all lesser things. Instead, are we willing, are we able to give the ultimate glory to the one who has provided any good gift we have received? And so as we end, I want to ask you this. Like, what do we do with this? I want three, three responses. So first, that we need to develop a heart of gratitude. As we pause right now and think of what are some good gifts that God has given to you? Maybe it's financial. Maybe, maybe it's relational. Maybe it's some experience God has given to you. What, what are some good things that God has brought into your life? We need to develop a heart of gratitude to him. That when we experience these things, both, both big and, and small. Like it, it's, I got to say, it's relatively easy to give praise to God if you, you go on a really nice vacation or you win the lottery. But in the small everyday 
aspects of life? Are there things that you can turn to and just give gratitude and thanks to God for what he has given to you? To develop a heart for this that you'll be able to recognize it more easily and more quickly in your life. The second thing you might want to consider doing is taking a fast from certain things in your life. You might realize that you have turned some things into an idol, and so you might want to fast from it, just distance yourself in in some way so that you can kind of determine, have, have I turned this into too big of a thing in my life? Has it taken over? Is it controlling my thoughts? Are you willing to take a step back and take a fast from it? Now, a fast is, you know, you say, hey, this is it still, it's a good thing, but I've, I've turned it into an ultimate thing. I've made it into a bad thing in my life. And so you might return back to it. Now, over time, I might realize, hey, this actually was a destructive thing all along. I should actually cut it out entirely. But, but either way, are you willing to take this step of just distancing yourself from a few things in your life to realize, you know, what, what do you hold as the most important thing in your life? And that can be hard. It means making some different decisions for yourself. It might mean making some different decisions uh, within your family. So you might need to work together to say, hey, we're just going to, we want to develop a greater sense of of generosity and gratitude. So we're we're just going to spend our money a little bit differently this month. That's that's a conversation. That Again, if you're married, like you're going to have to have that conversation with your spouse. Don't just try to do this on your own, but figuring out, hey, how are we pursuing God together? And then the last thing that we need to do is spend time with the giver. Spend time with God, the one who has given these good gifts to you. If you want to deepen your affection for God, if you want to know him more, you need to spend more time with him that you would get to truly know who he is. And this is my my conviction through studying this passage. As we eliminate these idols in our lives, that we are free to experience the joy that God truly wants us to experience. He wants to free you from anything that is holding you back today. That you would have greater and greater joy in him today. And this is what he is is calling you to. It might be hard in the moment, but he's not doing this to steal you of joy. He wants you to actually truly experience it today. And so I'm going to call up the worship team. And as we sing and as we worship here today, this needs to be our prayer. That God would show us how to be free from these things that we could have more joy in him. Let's worship together.